So you want to know how to use Laravel to build web applications, and I can't blame you. It is the most popular framework for PHP, which just so happens to be the most popular server-side language. So I guess that you could say that Laravel is extremely popular in the web application space, and there's a reason for that. Laravel is extremely approachable for just about anyone that has a basic understanding of PHP. Hi. I am Jeremy McPeak, and I invite you to spend some time with me so that I can show you just how approachable Laravel is. We'll start at the very beginning by setting up your environment for developing not just Laravel applications, but PHP development in general. We'll add the Laravel installer to our computer using Composer so that we can create Laravel projects on the fly. We'll then dive right into a Laravel project, and you'll learn how to create views and route HTTP requests so that you can see those views. From there, you'll learn about Laravel's templating engine called Blade, and how we can use it to create a consistent, flexible, and maintainable user interface for our application. You'll then learn how to work with data from within your views so that your application can dynamically display data. We'll then discuss databases and how you can create, modify, and even drop tables using migrations. We'll also look at Eloquent, which is how we work with databases from within our application, and you'll learn how to work with and handle user input in order to store it within a database, so that by the end of this course, you'll have the confidence to start writing your own data-driven applications with Laravel. We have a lot of ground to cover, so when you're ready, queue up the next video and we will get started. Of course, the first thing that we need to go over is what you need to set up your environment for not just Laravel development, but just PHP development in general. And we're going to start with what I personally use. It's called XAMPP. Now, one of the things about PHP is that in order to develop it, you have to download and install PHP. You have to uh, have a database engine. Well, not really, but if you're going to build anything worthwhile, you need a database engine. It also helps to have a web server like Apache. So you have to download and install and configure all of those things manually. And if you like doing that, then feel free to do so. I don't. And something like XAMPP gives you all of those things out of the box. They're configured. You can even turn on and off the services. And that's what I really like about something like this, because I don't always want those services running. So I can start whichever ones that I need and then I can turn them off whenever I'm done. So if that's the way that you want to go, feel free to download and install XAMPP. There are of course versions for Windows, Linux, and Mac OS. There's also subversions with different PHP versions. Now, if you don't want to use XAMPP, but you like the idea of using something like XAMPP, there's also something called MAMP. And there's nothing wrong with MAMP. I used to use MAMP before I went to XAMPP. And the only reason why I did is because at the time they didn't support the version of PHP that I needed. And this page is Windows centric. However, behind the scenes, they are detecting that I'm on Windows and they are always showing me Windows, which kind of stinks. I would like to see other platforms that are supported, but they do support Mac OS. They might support Linux. I don't really remember if they do or not. But that is another option. You install it, they configure everything, you turn on and off the services whenever you want. Now, if you want a more manual approach, but you don't want to go to the individual websites and download and install, and you're on Mac OS, then Homebrew is going to be your option. Uh, the website is brew.sh, and simply search for the packages that you want to download and install onto your machine. There is, of course, PHP. If you wanted to install MySQL, just do a search for that, and you'll find the command for installing that as well. And then finally, Laravel makes several tools available. In fact, they give you a Docker image that you can use. Now, if you're not familiar with Docker, it's not a virtual machine. It's more like a virtual operating system so that you can run applications. It's a really cool technology. And I really like this type of approach because it completely separates your development environment from your main environment, which is a practice that I've gotten into personally, just because I hate redoing my development environment when I set up a new machine. 
But if you go to the documentation and go to the installation, you're going to see your first Laravel project, and then you're going to see the getting started for whatever operating system that you are on. It's going to take you through the steps of using Docker. Now, unfortunately, we're not going to take this route in this course. It's a really awesome way of setting up an environment. However, my Docker installation is hosed after I upgraded it. But if you wanted to take this route, then feel free to do so. The instructions are very clear, just follow them and you will be good to go. So in our case, what we want to do is install Laravel with Composer. Now, if you don't have Composer, this is a package manager for PHP. I believe the website is Get Composer, but if you just do a search for Composer, there it is, getcomposer.org, download, and install it on your machine. And then from there, you'll want to open up a command line so that you can install the Laravel installer. Now, there is the option to not install the Laravel installer and just run it off of the web. However, I personally like to install the installer so that, well, it just speeds things up. So from the command line, after you install Composer, you will want to type Composer Global Require Laravel slash installer. And then this is going to install the Laravel installer on your machine so that whenever it's done, then we can create a new application by using the Laravel command. We will follow that up with new, and then we will name our project. I'll just call this first-app. This is going to install our application. It's going to set everything up so that whenever this is done, we can CD into that directory, fire up our code editor. We can even fire up the application itself and we will see it up and running. When the installer is done, then we will of course want to CD into first app. We can go ahead and fire up our code editor, but most important, we can run our application using Artisan, which is a command line interface for Laravel. And we'll say PHP Artisan Serve, that will run our application and it tells us where to go. So let's hop on over to the browser. We want to go to localhost port 8000 and we will see our application. There's not going to be a whole lot there, but we can at least see that it is up and running. And in the next lesson, we will see how this page is processed and sent to the browser. Laravel is a framework for building dynamic websites. I know that that sounds painfully obvious, but it's a distinction that I want to make because we almost have to get into a completely different mindset when it comes to building dynamic websites. Because what we see in the browser is not the result of just reading a file on the file system. That's what a static website does. So if this were a static website, and if we tried to go to about.html, well, the web server on that static website would try to find that file called about.html. If it found it, it would read that file and then return the contents back to the browser. There's no logic, there's no processing, there's nothing. It's just simply reading the file and then returning it. Now, of course, if it couldn't find that file, then it would return a 404 because that file didn't exist. But that's a static website. In a Laravel application, what we see is the result of executing a function or a method on the class. So if we try to go to slash about within our application, it's not that our application couldn't find a file called about, it's that we haven't written the code that's going to execute whenever we make a request for that URL. But that's very easy to do. All we have to do is create a route for that URL. And we do that by opening up our routes file. If you go to the routes folder, open up web.php, and we're going to see a very simple file. There's just really four lines of useful code. There's also some comments. If you wanna read that, that's fine. But let's first of all, look at what we have on line 16. So there's already one route defined. It's for a get request for the URL of just a slash. That is essentially our home page. You could also call it the root of our application. So whenever our application receives a request for our home page, it's going to execute the function that is specified here. And all it does is call another function called view. So what we see in the browser for our home page is nothing more than the result of calling that view function and then passing in the string of welcome. We'll talk about that later. 
But let's do this. Let's change the output here. So let's just say, hello, Laravel. And whenever we view this in the browser, let's just refresh. That's all we see. There's nothing else. And we can even view the page source. And once again, that's all we see. It's not adding anything extra. It is only returning the content that we have specified. So we have complete and total control over what we return for whatever URL. And this is very powerful because we can return anything. It doesn't have to be just text or HTML or CSS or JavaScript. It can be binary data like a PDF or an image or anything. We just have to write the code that's going to do it. And that sounds like a lot of work, and in some cases it is. But for the most part, it's, it's not. So let's change this, though. Let's add some HTML. Let's make it not just plain text, but big and bold plain text. So once again, we refresh, we can obviously see that the styling there changed. If we look at the source of the page, we can see that that was also updated as well. So once again, whatever we are returning from our routing functions is going to be what is sent back to the browser. Well, let's do this. We talked about an about page. So we need to write the code that's going to handle that request. So we want to start with the route facade. Then we need to decide what kind of request we want to handle here. Well, we only really want to handle a get request in this case, and we want the URL to be about. So we will then specify our function that is going to return the content for this URL. Uh, we could just, uh, let's use an H4 in this case, and we can say about page. Let's close the H4, and there we go. So now our application has two routes. We have one for the home page, one for the about page. So if we go back to the browser, the home page is now uh, showing us what we did before because I changed that back to using the view function. But if we go to about, then we see the about page. Okay, so that's great. Let's talk a little bit about this view function. So Laravel is what we call an MVC framework. M stands for model. That's essentially the data of our application. V stands for view, which is the user interface of our application. And then C is controller. And the controller is, well, it's kind of the glue between the data and the user interface. So what we could see here is that for our home page, we are returning the user interface called welcome. And we can see that inside of the resources folder, and then there's the views folder. Then there's a file called welcome.blade.php. So let's open that up. And we are going to see some HTML. In fact, there's more than HTML. If you look a little closer, you're going to see some stuff that kind of looks like PHP. Laravel has a templating engine called Blade. You could also call it a view engine. And that's the term that I will use, a view engine called Blade. So the name welcome is the name of the view. That's what we are looking at. Blade is the name of the view engine. And then of course it's a PHP file. So there's a lot of stuff going on whenever this view function is being called. That's executing the view engine to load the welcome view and then to process that view and make the decisions that it needs to make based upon some of these logic decisions and so on and so forth. The end result is, of course, what we would then see inside of the browser. So there's two very important things. I want you to take away from this lesson. First of all, our application is only going to handle the URLs that we specify. And we set up those URLs by creating a route so that our application can route a request to the code for that URL. The second thing that I want you to remember is that these routes can do anything. They can return any kind of content. It can be text, it can be binary, it can be anything because we are the ones that have to write the code for those routes. And in the next lesson, we're going to take things a little bit further. You're going to learn how we can extract data from the URL. In this lesson, we are going to be talking about user input because our applications are interactive. They accept user input. 
Now, one very important thing to be aware of is that a web application is actually at least two other applications. There's the application that runs within the browser, that's the client application, and we aren't really that concerned with the client application. We are concerned with the server application, that is our Laravel application. Now, of course, yes, the Laravel application is going to supply the content that is going to be in the client application, but we won't worry about that right now. Think in terms of a server-side application. Our server is just sitting there doing nothing until it receives a request, and that request always contains information from the user. That information could be the result of the user filling out a form and submitting it, or it could be something as simple as the user typing in the URL in the browser and then hitting enter so that they go to a particular page. It doesn't matter what kind of request or what generated the request. If the user initiated that request, that is our user input. So in this and the next lesson, we are going to be talking about URLs and specifically how we can pull information from the URL because that's one of the primary ways that the user will provide input for our application. So in this lesson, we're going to be talking about query strings. So let's assume that we are going to build a store that sells musical instruments. So we will have a URL that is slash store, but then we need to know what types of products to show. So, you know, the slash store could be the generalized URL to where we show kind of a little bit of everything. But then if we wanted to filter the results like on category, so if we wanted to show only guitars, then we could have a category query parameter and its value could be guitars. That is a very common use of a query string. So let's write the code that's going to be looking for that type of URL. Let's first of all, add a new route so that we have a new endpoint here. The URL is going to be slash store. And then we of course need the function that's going to execute for this particular route. So for right now, let's just return a string that says you are viewing the store. The reason being, we wanna make sure that we have some code that works here. And of course, this is something very simplistic, but it's always a good thing to see code that works. And there we go. We are viewing the store, that's great. So let's say that we want to now pull in the information from that category query parameter. Well, we have a built-in function called request, and then we simply pass it the string of the query parameter that we want to get the value for. So in this case, it's going to be category, just nothing complex about this. So let's store this in a variable. We'll just call that category. And then we could use this in the output so that we are viewing the store for and then we can concatenate that category. So we would have category there. We can go back to the browser. Let's add the query string so that we will have category and then we will start off with guitars. So now we see you are viewing the store for guitars and no matter what we change the category to be, the content that is displayed in the browser is of course going to change accordingly. Now that's all well and good, but the first rule of handling user input is to never trust users. That might sound a little harsh to hear, but yes, the vast majority of people are nice people. They don't care about your application as long as it works, but there's just the small few that will want to do something malicious. And it doesn't matter how big or small your application is. If it's on the internet, you are at risk and you are a potential target. So never trust user input because somebody could do something like this. Instead of submitting just a typical string for a category, we are going to alert, uh, let's just say hi. And Chrome, or this isn't Chrome, this is Edge, but it's built on Chrome, is going to, well, I did not expect that. That's good to know. So you can see what just happened. And the reason is very, is very simple. If we view the source, we are going to see that the script that we typed in the query string was output directly into the HTML. Uh, let's see if I have Chrome installed. I do. I don't use Chrome very much anymore. This is just personal preference, but Chrome will actually block that. So if we open this up, 
in Chrome, we will... Okay, Chrome used to protect you from this, but you can see the problem here. If we can inject something as simple as an alert box, then an attacker can inject something far more sophisticated that will then cause a lot more damage. So we want to protect our applications as much as possible, and it is our responsibility to do that. They are our applications. We are responsible for them. So to fix this, one thing we can do is just take the value from the query string and then pass that to strip tags. And if we view this in the browser, then we are not going to see that alert box display, thankfully. And instead we just see the text that was inside of the script tags. Now, as we start talking about views and the blade view engine, there are other tools that we can use. But for right now, this is going to work just fine. So just be aware that the user can supply malicious code. You want to protect your application from that code as much as possible. So we typically call that sanitizing inputs. Always sanitize your inputs. So instead of stripping tags wherever I use category, I'm going to strip tags whenever I grab the value from category. That's a much safer approach there. Now that's all well and good, but what if there's not a category in the query string? And that is a valid URL because if the user just goes to slash store, then we would want to show just all of the instruments. And right now we just say you are viewing the store for, and there's nothing else there. So this is where we can start to introduce some logic here. So we're going to take out this call to strip tags. We still need to do that, but we'll do that a little later. So for right now, we are going to attempt to get the value of the category query parameter. Now I say attempt because it's either there or it's not. And if it is, then great. We have something in the category variable so that we could check if it is set. So if it is set, then we of course want to display our message that they are viewing the store for that category. But this is where we want to use strip tags. So once again, we will call strip tags right there. But if we don't have a category, then we just want to show all of the instruments. So we will just have that content. You are viewing all instruments. So if we save this, our code is still going to work. If we refresh the page, we are viewing all instruments, but if we specify category, then we will see the store for that category. And so that is how we work with data in the query string. We retrieve the information from the query string by using the request function. We simply pass in the query parameter that we want to get the value for. But remember, always remember to never trust user input. So before we output that input, we want to sanitize it. And in our case, we strip out all of the HTML tags. Now there's more things that we need to do in order to protect ourselves and our application, but we will talk about that when we start getting into databases. For right now, this is going to be sufficient. And if we don't have a category, then we display the content for all of our instruments. Well, in the next lesson, we are still going to be talking about URLs, but we are going to be talking about URL wildcards because while this works and this has been around for tens of years, 20, 30 years, okay, maybe not 30 years, but it's been around for a while, we tend to not do that anymore. Instead, we might have a URL that looks like this to where we have store slash guitars or drums or whatever category that we want to display here. And we will look at how we can handle those kinds of URLs in the next lesson. In the previous lesson, you learned how we can pull data from the URL query string. It was really straightforward. We just use the request function, pass in the query parameter name, and then that will give us the value for that parameter. If that parameter is in the query string. Otherwise, we don't get anything. So if you need to rely upon that value, you need to make sure that you have a value to work with. Otherwise, 
your code's going to break. So in our case, if we had a category, we simply displayed content for that particular category. Otherwise, we showed the generalized content for just all of the instruments. So that's all well and good. However, that means that we have a URL that looks like this. It has a query string. And the problem with query strings is that it makes the URL less friendly. I mean, for us, our brains are automatically parsing this out as we look at it. So it makes it some sense to us, but for non-technical people, they're not really going to remember this. And it gets even worse if we have characters that have to be URL encoded. And then you can also make the argument that we really shouldn't even be using a URL like this for displaying like the categories or a particular item within a category. And instead we would do something like this to where we would have, of course, store, but then we would have the category and then the item. This is much, much cleaner. It's also easier to remember. And it also makes a whole lot of sense because from left to right, we are going from something that is very generic to something that is specific. And the more we go to the right, the more specific things get. Whereas with the query string, the order of the parameters doesn't matter at all. What matters is that they're there or they're not. So you can end up with URLs that make absolutely no sense whatsoever. But again, to us, they do, but for normal people, they don't. So having a clean and a hackable URL, what do I mean by that? Well, we can keep taking segments off or adding segments in order to filter down the content even more. I mean, we could take that to the extreme to where we would have the store followed by the category, followed by the manufacturer, followed by the individual item, or if there were different lines of products from this manufacturer, you could have a line one, and then you could have the item. I mean, you can make things kind of absurd. And of course, the more segments that you add to a URL, the more difficult it is going to be to remember it. You want something that's nice, easy for people to remember. So in our case, we're going to stick with just this three segments in the URL store category and item. And we can make this work very easily by using route parameters. So I'm going to take our store route. I'm going to copy it and we'll comment out the current version so that uh, we can replace it with this new version. And our URL is going to start off the same because we want this to be for our store. So the store is always going to be part of the URL. But then we want to specify the individual segments that are going to be dynamic. And we do that using a set of curly braces. And then inside of the curly braces, we have the route parameter. So we have store followed by the route parameter for category, followed by the route parameter for the item. And these map directly to parameters to the function that is handling this route. And there is a direct link between the names. So the route parameter category maps to the function parameter category. So this means that the names of your route parameters have to be valid PHP identifiers. But the beauty of this approach is that now the information is in the URL and it's automatically being passed to the function. So we don't even have to use the request function here. So the first thing we can do is check to see if we have a category. And if we do, then we can start branching our code here because if we have a category, then we possibly have an item. If we don't have a category, we don't have an item. So inside of our check to see if we have a category, we will do essentially the same thing for the item. And if we have an item, then we will show the content for that particular item. Otherwise, we will just show the content for the category. So as far as our item content is concerned, I will do this. You are viewing the store for, and then we will include the category. Another nice thing about this approach is that you don't really have to strip tags or sanitize this because if there's any characters that are not valid URL characters, then this isn't going to work at all. So in this particular case, we don't have to strip tags for category because if there were tags in the segment of the URL, it would not be a valid URL. And so we will finish this up with the individual item. 
So there we go. We have our content for the individual item. We have the content for the category. Then finally, we have the content for just the store in general. So if we go to the browser, let's refresh the page here. We're going to see that it doesn't work, 404. And this is why. Because by default, the route parameters are required. We have defined a URL with three segments. It starts with store, but then we have two segments defined after that. So what we want to do is make these route parameters optional. And we do that by just following up the identifier with a question mark. So we will have category question mark, then item question mark. Then we can give default values to our function parameters. And then our code's going to work. So if we go back to the browser, let's refresh. Now we see the all instruments content. If we look at uh, just pianos, I don't know if it's ES or just S, doesn't matter. If we look at pianos, then we can see that we are viewing the store for pianos. And then if we wanted to look at a Steinway, then we can see that we are looking at the store for pianos for Steinway. And so that is how we can build clean and memorable URLs. We simply define parameters inside of our route and match them up with a function parameter. If we want the parameters to be optional, then we have to follow that parameter with a question mark. We also need to provide a default value for the function parameter. And in most cases, you will want to use URL parameters. There are some cases where it makes sense to use a query string, but I would argue that those are few and far between. So far, we have been using closures to define our routes, and for small applications, that's perfectly fine. However, as our applications grow, as we add more routes, and especially as our routes become more complex, well, this can be very cluttered. So what we want to do is start to organize our code into logical chunks. Like for example, there are three routes. Two of them are somewhat related. We have the welcome page, and then we have the about page. And even though those are completely different routes, they serve somewhat the same purpose in that they provide content for, well, kind of the home part of the application. It's not necessarily a home page, but you know, there's the welcome page, there's an about page. If we had a contact page, I would say that this is part of the home content. So let's add a contact page. That would be nice to have. So if there was anything that was just generic to the website itself, then I would consider that part of the home content. And so we could put those routes inside of their own file. But then we would have a separate file for the store route. And any other routes that we would need to write for the store, we would put inside of that same file. If we had some other content that wasn't uh, related to the home stuff or the store, but let's say that we had some information about different kinds of collections. Like there are some music stores that will have a collection of stuff that they don't sell, but you know they still collect it. So if the store collects guitars, then we could have a guitars route. And then from there, there could be individual pages for individual guitars that they would want to provide content for. You know, so that would be in a completely separate file because that had nothing to do with the home stuff or the store. It would be just the guitars. So we want to start to create these new files that contain the functionality for these routes, because in actuality, we still need to define our routes here inside of this web.php file. But as far as the code that's handling those routes, we want to define that elsewhere. So we are going to create what are called controllers. Now, if you'll remember from a few lessons ago, I said that Laravel is an MVC framework. That stands for Model View Controllers. Controllers are classes that have methods. We call them action methods. And those action methods handle requests. And that's basically it. That sounds very simplistic. And in a lot of cases, it is that simplistic. However, in other cases, it's not. So in this lesson, we are going to create a home controller for all of this home-oriented content. So let's go to the app folder 
let's open up HTTP, and then there's going to be a controllers folder. And you can see that there's already a file in here called controller.php. This is the base controller class that you don't have to use. In fact, you can write a controller that would be just a normal class, it doesn't inherit from any other class, and you would be fine there. But this controller class has a lot of utilities that you would probably want to use, so it makes sense to create a controller class that would inherit from this. So we could create a new file here, we could call it home controller. The name really doesn't matter, but remember that we want this to be logical. We don't want to just call it something random. This is stuff oriented to the home content. So we start it with home and we follow it up with controller. So we know that this is the controller for all of the home stuff. It just makes sense. So we could take this route or we could use artisan. Artisan is the CLI for Laravel. And we're going to use Artisan because it's a fantastic tool that gives us a lot of functionality. In fact, if you just type PHP Artisan, you're going to see everything that it can do for us. <laughs> There's quite a lot, even just the make portion, which is what we want to do because we want to make a controller. But you can see that there's a lot of things that you can make with Artisan. And the great thing is every one of these commands have their own options. And Artisan is just going to stub out exactly what we want it to. So let's look at PHP Artisan make controller dash H. That's going to show the help for the make controller command. And you can see that there are several other things. One of note is this resource. We're not going to look at a resource controller class in this lesson, but we will definitely use this and you will definitely use it in your applications. And the great thing about this is if you do use the dash R flag, it's going to generate a class that has all of the methods for creating a resource controller. So artisan is a fantastic tool. We need to use it. So PHP artisan make controller. And then we just follow that up with the name of the controller that we want to create home controller. And then there we go. We have our class. If we go back to our code, we can see that there is now a home controller.php file inside of our controllers folder. It gives us the class. It inherits from the controller. So now we just need to write our action methods. So uh, we will start with the welcome page, which we could call welcome. But since this is kind of the home page, uh, we'll, or the index page, I guess we should use index page. I'm going to call this index. That's just convention. You don't have to follow convention, but convention is there. Well, because it's convention and all we are going to do is return the view. We are basically going to take the contents of this closure. We could just cut that out. We could paste this here and then just give it the name of index. So we will say public function index and then voila. We'll do the same thing for the about and contact. So let's cut and then we will paste and let's give this a name of about. And then finally, we will do the same thing for contact. But since we already have that functionality, we'll just copy about. So there we go. We have our controller. All we need to do then is link the action methods that we've defined here to the routes. And we do that very easily. The first thing we need to do is import that home controller. So that is inside of app HTTP controllers. And then we will bring in home controller. And this is what we'll do. We are still going to say route and then get, we still specify our URL, but the second argument that we pass is going to be an array where the first element is the class that we are going to use home controller in this case. And then the second element is going to be the name of the method that we want to use. So index in that case. So we'll just copy that, paste it a couple of times and then make the necessary changes. So for the about, it's going to use the about method and then contact will use the contact method. So this is much cleaner and our code is still going to work just like it did before. So if we go to the browser, let's refresh this page 
And, well, we have something wrong. App HTTP controller. Oh, uh, controllers. It's amazing what one keystroke will do. So there we go. We have that. If we go to about, we're going to see our about page. If we go to contact, which we just added, we will see our contact page. Views are essentially the user interface in a Laravel application. They are what generates the markup that is then sent to the browser. But a view is so much more than just markup. It's in fact a template that has to be processed in order to generate that markup. And we have very briefly looked at views. Uh, they are inside of the resources folder and then views. And then the only view we have is the welcome view, welcome.blade.php. That is, of course, what we see when we go to the index of our home controller. That is the welcome. And while the majority of this file is markup, there are some templating directives that have to be processed. Like for example, here is an if block. It's uh, basically determining if the route has login. If it does, then this content is going to be shown. But there's more than just this content because there are templating expressions, really, that have to be evaluated and processed and then ultimately rendered into markup. So what we are going to do starting in this lesson is spend some time with views because, well, they are very important to our applications. And we're going to start by creating an about view for our about action method. Uh, so let's open up our home controller that is app, HTTP controllers, and then home controller. And basically what we want is a single view for every action that is going to return a view. Now it is technically true that we could reuse this welcome view. We could add in the if checks to determine whether or not if it's a welcome or about or contact. And we can put all of the content inside of welcome if we wanted. However, we don't want to do that because that's going to really clutter up our welcome view. So we essentially want a single view for a single action method. So this means that we need an about view and a contact view. Now we can create those from scratch or we can just copy the welcome view and use that as a basis. So let's do that and let's rename the copy to about.blade.php. Now, the name of the file is arbitrary. There is no magic linkage between the name of the file and then the action method that we are going to use that view for. Because whenever we call the view function, we have to specify the name of the view that we want to use. So in this case, about. So you can call your views whatever you want, but it makes sense to name the views according to the action method that they are going to be used for. So we've created an about view. We will do the same thing for the contact view. But let's first of all, change some of this content for about because we can go to about now and we are going to see the exact same thing that we would for the uh, index. Although it would help if we saved the controller. So let's save that file and then refresh and then there we go. So we want something that's a little bit different and we can do that by just starting to delete a lot of stuff here. All right, so this div element right here has this SVG. This is the Laravel logo and branding there. So let's get rid of that and let's just have an H1 to where we say about us. And then we want some content that is just going to have like a P element and that'll be it. So let's get rid of most of this stuff and let's see, let's go all the way down here. I think that's it. Yep, everything else lines up. And then this is where we will have our P element. This is the about page. And let's also change up some of this styling here. We'll change the background color to be whatever is the pages. Let's get rid of the shadow and the rounded border. Okay. So if now we look at our about page, this is what we have. It's very bland, but it is at least very different. So that's great. And we can use this as a basis for our contact view. So let's just copy that file. Let's rename that to contact 
blade.php. And then let's make the appropriate changes so that this says contact us. And this is the contact page. We of course need to change our home controller so that we will now call view inside of the contact action method. And we want to use the contact view there. So if we go to slash contact, then there we go. We will see the contact us. Now I would like some way to navigate between these different views. So let's add some navigation and we won't do anything too fancy. We'll just add a nav bar at the top. So we'll start with a div. Let's reuse this relative class. And then we're also going to add in a padding. Now this does not exist in the classes that are defined in the template. So we will need to define this, but we're going to say P-4. And then inside of here, we'll have our nav, and then we will have our links. And we'll have one for each page. So we'll start off with the welcome. We'll just call that home, because that's typically what we would see. And then we will have the about, which will be to slash about. The text, uh, we could say about us, but let's just keep it nice and clean, and we'll just have about and contact there. So let's view this in the, oh, we do need to define this P4 class, don't we? We can do that in this second style here. So uh, we'll say P4, we'll say the padding is gonna be one REM. And if we go to the browser, let's refresh. And that's okay. Let's put some padding in between the uh, links here. And uh, we could add classes, but let's do this. We'll just say nav a, and then we will say that the padding is going to be, uh, let's say 0.5 REM. And that should give us some spacing there. That looks good. All right, so now we just have to replicate that inside of the other pages. So let's start with the markup itself. We'll go to the about page and we will paste that in at the top. We will also need to do that on the welcome. And I really have no idea what this is going to look like. This might look horrible, but we will soon find out. And then we need the uh, CSS there. So let's go back to our contact view. Let's copy the CSS and then we will paste it into the about view and then the welcome view. Uh, let's go to the about page. That looks great. Let's go to home and okay, that looks great as well. So now we have views for each one of our content pages and we also can navigate between them. But well, that was kind of cumbersome, wasn't it? We had to copy the markup that we wanted, paste it into the appropriate files. And if we added more views, we would have to do the same thing for each individual view, as long as we wanted to keep this same nav bar at the top. And that's very cumbersome. But thankfully, we can create what are called layouts that allows us to define essentially the layout of our application. And we will look at that in the next lesson. In the previous lesson, we created two new views, one for about, the other for contact. And we also created this nifty little menu so that we can navigate in between our different endpoints. And we added that to each one of these views, including the existing welcome view. And that's all well and good, but the problem is how we went about implementing that. We first of all copied all of the markup for the menu, and we went inside of each individual view file and pasted it into the correct place. We also needed to paste in some CSS rules so that it would be displayed how we wanted it. And, you know, for a small amount of views, that's okay, I guess you could say. But as our application grows, that's just not feasible. That is a maintenance nightmare because any change that we would make, we would have to go into each individual view and make those changes. So the way that we get around that is by using what's called a layout. It is a specialized view that essentially contains all of the layout of our application. And what is the layout? Well, it's basically all of this boilerplate stuff that all of our views use. So the layout in our case would start with the dot type 
and it would consist of basically everything inside of our view except for the actual content, which we could say would be this, this div with the class of max W6XL and so on and so forth. This would be the content. So let's start by creating a new file. And since this is the layout view, we're gonna call it simply layout and dot play dot PHP. And we are going to take the entire contents of about and then paste it inside of layout. And the only thing that we want to take out is what we would consider the actual content. So we're going to delete that from inside of our layout. And for right now, we're gonna have the content placeholder. This is where we will put our content. We'll get to that. Let's go to our about view. And we want to get rid of practically everything except the content. So let's go ahead and let's do that. And then we need to tell this about view that we want to use the layout that we just created. And we do that with a directive. A directive in blade templates basically starts with an at sign. And in this case, we're going to use a directive called extends. Now this is a lot like the extends that's used for classes. You have a class that extends a base class. Well, here we have a view that is going to extend a layout. And then we simply just pass in the name of the view that we want to use as the layout. And there we go, but that's not enough. We also need to create a section that essentially denotes that we have some content here. So we can just call the section content because well, that's what it is. And then we would denote the end of that section. So that in between the section and in section, that is the content section. So now we just need to display this inside of the layout. And we do that with a special directive called yield. We pass in the name of the section that we want to yield. And there we go. So content in this case. So if we go to the about view, let's just hit refresh. It's going to look the exact same, but to prove that we are using the layout, we can do anything. Uh, we can just put layout in front of the yield directive and we will see layout somewhere right over there. All right, so we have this layout that we are now using and we just need to update the other views to use the layout. Let's start by going to the about view. Let's copy the extends and the opening section and then we will replace everything before the content with that. Then we will close out the section with the end section directive. And I'm going to change the formatting here just so that it looks nice and clean. And we can do the same thing for the welcome view. So let's find that though. In this particular case, uh, the content starts here, really. So we want to get rid of everything before that. And I guess we should have done it like this uh, so that we could collapse everything uh, so that we can see what is and isn't going to be content. So this would be the end section here. Then we would have layout and section directive there. So there we go we have our views. And of course, we can go to the browser and view this just to make sure that everything looks okay. And it should. So let's go to about. That's great. We can go to contact and we can go to home. Everything looks the same as it did before. Now, something else that you might want to do is add another section because this gives us the flexibility to do that. So let's say that we might want to have a certain JavaScript on certain pages. So we could have a section called scripts so that if we had that section defined, let's say inside of contact, because that would make sense. This would be a contact form, really. So we would have some JavaScript for uh, client side validation and stuff like that. So we would have a section called scripts and then we would have our script here. And let's just do this. We will say alert contact us just so that we can see that happening. That'll probably get annoying here in a little bit, but that's okay. And there we will have our in section directive. So if we go to contact, now we can see that we have that contact us. But if we go to about, 
There's no error or anything else. It just recognizes that there wasn't a section called scripts inside of the about view. So there was no reason to actually output anything as far as the scripts are concerned. And that's all well and good. But something else that we could use this for is like the title, because each one of these pages would have a different title. So here we could, inside of the title element, we could yield... Well, let's just call it title. So that inside of our other views, we will simply just specify this section. And this is going to be a little bit different. We can still do that the same way that we have done with the uh, section directive and then the end section directive. But since this is something much more simple, what we can do is this. We still need section. We still need to specify the name of that section, but we can pass in a second argument, which would be the value that would be displayed for this section. So that this is about, this could be about us. And then let's just copy and paste this so that we can add the title to those others. So there is still some repetition, at least as far as copying and pasting is, is concerned, but it's mostly for showing different content. It's not so much showing the same thing across all of the views. So let's go to welcome. We will add that section and this will just say welcome. So now we can go back to the browser and we can definitely see in the tabs. Now we have about us. If we go home, we'll see welcome. If we go to contact, we'll see contact us along with our script. So layout views are very important. They allow us to define essentially the layout of our application. The key thing to remember is to use the extends directive inside of your views so that they will use the layout and then to yield the sections that you want the layout to well yield. Valid and correct URLs are very important. In fact, they are probably the most important thing in a web application because without correct URLs, well, nothing is going to work. And it's not just navigating from page to page. It's also linking to other resources like CSS, JavaScript, images, you know, things like that. So in this lesson, we are going to look at two things. First of all, where you can put your static resources. The second thing is how to link to them. And it might sound obvious, but there are some issues there. So let's start by looking at where we can put our static resources, and that is inside of the public folder. Now, there are already some files in here. One of those is this index.php. This is, well, all of the files within our application are important, but this one is the entry point of our application. So without this, nothing works. But if you scroll down, you can see where the bootstrap file is being pulled in. Now that is not the CSS framework. That is bootstrapping this application and it's creating the application, uh, handling the request and getting the response. So this is a very important file. We want to leave it alone. So let's just close out of it before we really screw something up. And everything inside of this public folder is considered at the root of our application. So what exactly does that mean? Well, this index.php, for example, the URL for that would then be um, let's see, we are at localhost port 8000 slash, and then index.php. The robots would be robots.txt and so on and so forth. So this is where we can put our static resources like our CSS and stuff like that. And that is exactly what we are going to do. We are going to create a new folder called CSS. And then inside of there, we will create a new file called site.css. And we are going to take the CSS inside of the style element. So that is this body rule as well as the P4 class we created and then the rule for our navigation. And we are going to put that inside of site.css, which then means that we need to link to that. So we will use a link element and the URL. Uh, well, that should be CSS slash site.css. That should work just fine. So let's go to the about page, let's refresh, and everything looks like it did before, so that's great. But let's look at this. We're going to change the route for about. And all we are going to do is just say slash about slash about. 
So if we go back to the browser, let's refresh this page. We are going to get a 404 because we no longer have a page at just slash about. We have to go to slash about slash about. And this is going to look mostly the same, but notice the menu. The styling is off. And the reason is very simple. The browser is looking for our site.css in the wrong place. So let's copy that link address and we'll take a look at that. So it is looking for the CSS folder, which we know is at the root because we put that inside of the public folder. Uh, it's looking for that CSS folder inside of about, and that is definitely wrong. Now, there are some ways that we can get around this, but there is a foolproof way that's just going to make it so that we don't have to even think about this. All we have to do is use a utility that the Blade templating engine gives us. It's a function called URL. So let's go back to our layout page. And instead of just directly putting the URL inside of the href, we are going to use this URL function to where we pass in the relative URL and the magic is just going to happen. So if we go back to the browser, refresh the about slash about, we can see that now it is pulling in the appropriate CSS file. If we go to any one of these other views, then everything is going to look the same because the URL is going to be correct. So when it comes to uh, not just linking to static resources, but any resource within our application, it makes sense to use the URL function because all we have to do is supply the relative URL and it's going to generate the appropriate URL and we don't ever have to worry about having an incorrect URL once again. Now in the next lesson, we are going to take this a step further and we are going to look at how we can generate URLs based upon routes. So that once again, we don't have to worry about thinking of what is the correct URL for the correct route. Blade will just handle that for us. In the previous lesson, we looked at the URL function and how it can foolproof the URLs for our application's resources. I mean, we don't have to think about it. We just pass in the relative URL to that URL function and we're good to go. And it would be nice if we could do the same thing for our routes. And we could, I mean, technically we could use the URL function. So for our home, we could say URL and then use the slash there. And then that would link to our home page or the welcome page. But I want something a little more robust because URLs change. Uh, they don't change very often, but they do change. And I would like the application to adapt to those changes so that if we ever just change the URL of our route like we did for the about, then that would just automatically be reflected in other parts of the application. And we have that capability. Instead of using URL, there's another function called route. But we don't pass in a URL, we pass in the name of that route. So let's first of all look at how we can name our routes. And it's very simple. All we have to do is chain a call to the name method whenever we define a route. So here we are setting up the route for the get request for the index on our home controller. So the name in this case could be index, but as you'll see, as you add more controllers, you're gonna have a lot of indexes. So it makes a lot of sense to use the name of the controller and then the name of the action on that controller and I use a dot in between those two values so that we will have home index and then we can essentially do the same thing for about and contact. Then we just need to uh, make the necessary changes. And there we go, we have named our routes. They are unique, that's very important. Our routes need to have unique names. And so now we can use those names to generate the URLs. So for the home page, that was home index, then let's just copy and paste, and then we will make the necessary changes for the about route and then the contact route. So let's go back to the browser, let's refresh. Now we know that the about is different because we changed that in the previous lesson. It is slash about slash about. So let's inspect this and we can look at the URL that was generated. And there it is, slash about slash about. 
So if we click on this, it's going to automatically take us to the about page. That's great. Of course, if we click on home, we see the index view. So let's change our URL back to just slash about because that's what we want anyway. Then all we have to do is just refresh the page. If we look at the about link, we can see that the URL is now updated. We don't have to worry about that at all. So as you are linking to other routes, it makes a lot of sense to name your routes so that you can use the route function to generate the URL for those routes. It takes just a few seconds, but it saves you a whole lot of headache later on. We need to start moving towards working with data. So in this lesson, we are going to create a resource controller, and we will also talk about what a resource controller is, but we will also wire everything up as far as the routes, as well as the first few views that we are going to use to display some things. So let's start by creating a resource controller. We will use Artisan to do that because, well, it just makes it so much easier to do it, especially with a resource controller and you'll see why. And I could explain to you what a resource controller is, but it's just a whole lot easier just to show you. And that's what we are going to do. So the command is PHP artisan make controller, and then the name of the controller that you want to create. This is going to be a resource controller for guitars, and then the resource flag. Uh, the option is to have just dash R, but I like verbosity when it comes to commands like this, because as I'm looking at the screen, I want to see that this is a resource. What the heck is dash R? So here we go. We have just created our controller and it's going to end up in the same place as our home controller. So that is app HTTP controllers. And then there's guitars controller. And there's going to be a lot here. So this is why Artisan makes this so much easier, because if you're going to create a resource controller, then you would have to implement all of these methods. OK, so what is a resource controller? Well, a resource is really nothing more than a single type of data that your application is going to work with. And the controller contains all of the action methods for working with that particular type of resource. So what do we do with the resource? Well, it's primarily four things. We create, read, update, and delete. We refer to that as CRUD, C-R-U-D. And a resource controller provides everything necessary for CRUDing a resource. So in this particular case, a resource is a guitar. Now, it would be great if it was an actual guitar, but no, it's just the uh, information about the guitar, things that we would store in a database, such as the name, the manufacturer, the year that it was manufactured, and things like that. So I'm going to mark some of these with the types of HTTP requests that are used. So index would be for showing all of the particular resource. So since this is a guitars controller, the index action method would be for displaying all of the guitars in the database. So that is a get request. Create is a get request. Because when it comes to creating a resource, you essentially need two things. You need a get request for showing the UI for creating that resource. And then you need the method for actually creating that resource in the database. So the create method is for showing the UI for creating a resource. The store method is for actually storing or creating that resource in the database. Then there's the show method, which is for showing an individual resource. So this would use the provided ID to fetch the appropriate record out of the database. And then this would show that information. The edit is a get request for showing the UI for editing a particular resource with the given ID. And then that is followed up with update, which is for actually updating the item that you want to edit. Now, this is a little bit different because the update action method will execute differently based upon what was actually requesting it. If it was a request from the web browser from the actual web form, it would be a post request because browsers don't support any other kinds of requests except get and post when it's coming from a form. Now, if it's coming from JavaScript, then it can be a put or a patch. It depends upon the type of update 
that you are going to do. But since we will be dealing primarily with just a form, it is going to be post. So we'll just leave it as post and then destroy, which is for removing or deleting a resource. So this would be deleting a record from the database. And that is the delete HTTP method. Let's start with the index and we are going to return a view. We'll call that view index because me personally, when it comes to views, I like to associate the views with the action methods just because it makes it easier for my brain to link those two things together. So let's go ahead and let's create that view. We'll go to the resources views folder. But before we create this file, let's think about the future because any application is probably going to have multiple controllers. Some of those controllers will more than likely be resource controllers. So that means we will have multiple index action methods, which means that we will have multiple index views. So it makes sense to start organizing our views according to the controllers that are going to use them. So inside of the views folder, I'm going to create a new folder simply called guitars. The idea being that this is the folder that contains the views for the guitars controller. That's the typical convention. You can use whatever convention you want. And then inside of this guitars folder, we will create a new file called index.blade.php. Let's go ahead and extend the layout. Let's also go ahead and define the section for the content. And we'll just say that this is content. Uh, in the next lesson, we will actually provide some content here. And we of course need to close out that section. So that's our view. We'll close that for now. But since our view is inside of a different folder, we need to change the name of the view that we want to use. It can't just be index anymore because that would be a file directly inside of the views folder. We need to specify that it is in the guitars folder. And we do that just with guitars followed by a dot and then the name of that view. So guitars.index. When it comes time to implement the create UI or the create view, it would be guitars.create. Uh, then we would have guitars.show and so on and so forth. So with that setup, all we have to do is wire up the routes. So let's go to our routes and we could define each individual route for each individual action method, but no, I mean, you can, if you want to, but time's valuable. We are going to use a method called resource and it is going to do all of the work for us. It's not only going to create the routes, but it's also going to give them unique names so that we don't really have to worry about anything. All we have to do is pass in kind of the URL prefix that we would want to use. So by using guitars here, this means that all of the routes are going to be based upon slash guitars. So our index is just going to be slash guitars, but the create method would be create. The edit method would be edit. In order to display an individual guitar, it would just be the ID from the database. So we don't have to worry about any of that at all. Calling this resource method, passing in guitars, is going to automatically do that for us. So that then all we need to do is specify what controller is going to be used and that is simply guitars controller class. And we do need to import that, don't we? So let's just copy what we did for home controller and then make the necessary changes there. And there we go. So let's add a link. Now, remember I said that this is automatically going to name the routes for us. We don't have to worry about that. And it's very simple. It's going to start with guitars, which is the name that we passed as the first argument followed by the action method. That's it. Guitars.index will be the name for the index route. Guitars.create, guitars.store, guitars.show. So it kind of falls in line with the naming scheme for the views as well. So let's open up about, let's add a link to guitars. Let's put this after home. And all we need to do is say, guitars.index, we will have our guitars there. So as long as I saved all of the files, uh, this should work. 
Let's refresh here. Inside of our menu, we should see guitars. We do. If we click on guitars, everything should still be there. And then this is content. So we are seeing the content from the guitars index view. So in the next lesson, we are going to actually display information. We're going to pass data to the view so that we can work with that data to display the information. In this lesson, we are going to start working with data. Now, for right now, the data is going to be static in that it will be hard-coded into the application. But eventually, once we get into working with databases, we will remove this static data so that we can work with actual data. So I have pasted in a method called getData. It simply returns an array of arrays, and each one of those arrays have an ID to represent the record ID, and then the name of a guitar, and then the brand of that guitar. And we just want to display this information. So the first thing we need to do is pass this data to the view. And the way that we do that is by passing a second argument in the view function. It's an array where the keys are essentially the variables that we are going to use inside of the view. So it makes sense to just call this guitars. And then the data for this will be from calling the get data method. Let's also do this. Let's assume that for whatever reason, we are handling user input. So the user fill out a form and we want to do something with that data in the view. Now, we aren't going to sanitize anything here, but I want to stress sanitize your inputs. This is strictly for demonstration purposes. So please remember to sanitize your inputs. But in this case, we aren't. We are going to assume that the user that submitted the form is trying to inject some highly malicious JavaScript so that they can, well, alert a message that says, hello. So this allows us to pass as much information to the view as we need, and we have complete control over how we refer to that information. All right, so let's go to the view, and let's just start implementing this. So instead of our content, let's start with the div element that was being used in the about and contact views. So this one right there, and we will encapsulate everything inside of that div there. So we have our guitars and it's an array. So we want to display the list. That means we need to loop over that array. So we have a for each directive, which is pretty much exactly like the for each loop in PHP, except that it begins with at for each and it ends with end for each. There are no curly braces or anything like that. But other than that, it's just a normal for each loop. So that inside of the parentheses, we have guitars as guitar, and then we just need to output the HTML, which let's have a div that's going to have an H3 element where we are going to output the guitar's name. And then we will have an unordered list where the list item will have made by, and then we will include the guitar's brand. So there we go. And then after the loop, let's have another div element where we will say user input, and then we want to output that user input. So bear in mind, we are not sanitizing anything as far as the user input. I want to make that clear. We should, but we aren't. So this could potentially be a very, very bad thing. Thankfully, it's not. So let's go to the browser. Let's refresh the page here. And we see our list of guitars. And then at the very bottom, we can see the user input. And we can see that the HTML was not rendered as actual HTML. So the script didn't have a chance to execute because it was HTML encoded. So there's a couple of things that I want to talk about regarding these double curly braces. First of all, what is inside of the double curly brace is a PHP expression. So that means you have to follow the same PHP syntax rules as just normal PHP code. That's important because there's times 
I don't necessarily forget that, but there's times that I guess I'm in too much of a hurry and I do have some syntax errors. Like I might forget to put a dollar sign in front of a variable, which of course is a syntax error. And you will definitely see an error if you make that type of mistake, just like that. So just try your best to remember that it is a PHP expression. It can be something more than just a simple variable like we are using here. It can be a complete expression. The second thing to remember is that it automatically HTML encodes the output. So it is a safe way to output information, especially if it is coming to the user. Once again, though, sanitize the input. Because even though Blade is essentially saving you by encoding the output, that is still stuff that you don't want to store in the database, if that is what you are going to do with it. So just sanitize your inputs, you will be fine. As a secondary, Blade will protect you as long as you output information using the double curly braces. All right, so that's all well and good, but let's also assume that we might call that get data method and not get anything in return. It might be an empty array. That would represent that there would be nothing in the database. So let's write some code that's going to handle that situation. So let's comment out the records, if you will, inside of the array, and let's go back to the index. So we only want to display the list if there is in fact a list to output. So we can wrap this with another directive, the if directive. It's just like a normal if statement in PHP to where we can check to see if the guitar's length or the count is greater than zero. If it is, then we want to show our guitar list. Otherwise, we want to display at least a message saying that there is no guitars or something like that. So we will use the else directive there. Then we will have the output for no guitars. There are no guitars to display. And then finally, we end the entire block with end if. So now we have some logic inside of our views. If we have guitars, we show them. If not, we show the message. There are no guitars to display. And once again, thankfully, Blade is protecting us from not sanitizing our inputs. But of course, if we change this back to where we do have guitars, well, then our content is going to change. We will show the list of guitars, and then that message saying that there are no guitars are gone, which is, of course, what we would expect. So in the next lesson, we are going to implement the show view. In this lesson, we are going to implement the functionality for showing an individual resource. This means that we want to write the functionality for the show method on our controller. And we, of course, want to create the show view to, well, show that data. Now, when this class was generated, it used this ID as the parameter for this method. And the idea behind that is that this is the ID of the record in the database. It's a unique identifier so that you can find the unique resource that you want to display. And in most cases, that is an integer value. However, it doesn't have to be an integer. It can be any type of value as long as it is unique for an individual resource. So if that's a string, then use string. It just really depends upon the type of data that you're working with. In our case, it is an integer value because each one of our records, if you will, has an ID value. So the first thing that we want to do is take this ID and search our data for that record that has the ID. So let's start by getting our data. We'll just store this in a variable called guitars. We want to call that get data method. And there are several different ways that we can do this. I'm going to use the easy way and just use array search. Now, this isn't enough. Basically, what we want to do is say that we want to find the ID in the provided array. But our array is a multi-dimensional array. So what we want to do is search within the individual arrays for the ID value of whatever was supplied here. So what we can do is go ahead and get the values of all of the columns. 
So we can call array column. We will pass in the guitars and then we specify the column that we want to retrieve, which is going to be the ID. So this is going to give us an array that contains just the ID values so that we can search that with the given ID, which is going to give us the index. Now, there are two possible values that we can get by calling array search. It can be false if it doesn't find what we're looking for, in which case we need to check to see if it's false. So we need to use three equal signs here because the alternative is an integer value that represents the index in our data array. And if it's zero, well, that could be considered false. So we want to check to make sure that the index that we receive is exactly false. And if it is, well, then that resource doesn't exist. And how we handle that is simply by returning a 404. Otherwise, we are going to return the data based upon the provided index. So we are going to call the view function. Uh, we'll call this guitars.show. And then we want to pass in the data for this individual guitar. So we'll just give it a key of guitar, and then we will provide the data there. So that is the guitar at the given index. So we can go ahead and implement that view. We're going to put this inside of the guitars folder. So let's create a new file there. We'll call it show.blade.php. Let's copy what we have for the index view. And we will use that as a basis because that already has a lot of the stuff that we want, such as using the layout, defining the content section, and at least it has some of the markup. So in this particular case, we don't really need to check to see if we have a guitar, because if we don't, the controller is already going to return a 404. So all we really need to do is display the guitar information, and we already have markup for that. So let's get rid of the loop. We'll also get rid of the if statement and we don't have any user input here. So we are essentially going to show what we did on the index, but in this case, it's going to be just an individual guitar. And wow, did I mess up that markup. So uh, there we go. The unordered list should not be inside of the H3. So now all we need to do is link to this view. And we can do that, of course, inside of the index view. Uh, we do need to fix this markup now. So let's move that unordered list outside of the H3 element because we want a link inside of the H3. So this is where we will have our href and we will use the route function in order to generate the URL for our resource. So let's call route. And in this case, the name of the route was automatically given to us because whenever we set up the route, we called the resource method. So by calling the resource method that automatically created named routes for all of our actions on the guitars controller. And in this case, it is guitars.show. So that is the route name that we need to use. But this isn't enough because we also need to tell it what guitar that we want to show. So let's go ahead and first of all, go to the browser, let's refresh the page, and we are going to see an error that we are missing the required parameter for guitars.show. The URL is guitars, and then the route parameter is called guitar. Now, this is interesting because if we look at our controller, it created a parameter called ID. And remember that there is a direct relationship between the route parameter, which is called guitar. I mean, we see that right there with the parameter name in our controller. So this means that we need to go to our show method. We need to change this ID to guitar. And we only used that value in one spot. So we can go ahead and make that change there. But then we need to go to the index view and where we are calling the route function, we need to supply that guitar value. So we're going to pass in an array where the key is the route parameter. And then we want to supply the value, which is the ID. And then that is going to give us our URL. So we can refresh the page. Now we can see that everything is okay. 
And if we click on any one of these links, it is going to take us to the individual page for that guitar. So there we have the American Standard Strat. If we click on the Talman, we will see the Talman guitar there. And if we wanted to test the functionality for showing a 404, well, we definitely don't have a guitar with an ID of 10. So let's try that. And we see a 404 as a result. So there we go. We have implemented showing an individual resource. So in the next lesson, we can actually get started working with data. We'll get our database up and running and we will start creating our model. In this lesson, we are going to configure our project to connect to a database. And the first thing we need to do is make sure that the database is up and running. Now, if you are using XAMPP or MAMP, just fire up the control panel and make sure that the database engine is running. Mine isn't, so I'm going to start that. I'm also going to start Apache because my management tools are web-based. Now, if you manually installed MySQL or you used Composer, then MySQL is probably running right now. So then the question becomes, how do we manage it? Well, you can use the built-in command line tooling if you want to go that route. When it comes to working with databases, I prefer a graphical interface. So I'm going to use a web-based management tool called PHP MyAdmin. It's been around for a very long time. Now that doesn't mean that it's antiquated and hasn't been updated because it has. It works very well. It's rock solid. And it's my go-to tool for managing a MySQL database. If you don't want to go that route, there are other options. You can download the MySQL Workbench from the MySQL website. It is free. You can download and install it and connect to your database. There are many other tools available as well. But really, once we create our database, we aren't really going to be using the tools because everything else is going to be done using Artisan. So let's go to our project, first of all, because we need to configure our project to know where our database is. So open up the .env file, and we are interested in the settings that begin with db underscore. There's a connection, which is the type of database that we are going to work with, the host, which is the machine that the database is running on, and its port, the database that our project is going to connect to, the username and the password. Now, of course, most of these are going to be different based upon your configuration. But I should also point out that MySQL, that's just the default. There are other options. If you go to the config folder, and then open up database. If we scroll down a little bit, we are going to see the different kinds of connections. So there's SQLite, there's MySQL, there's Postgres, there's Microsoft SQL Server. So if you wanted to use any of these, then you would just use these keys as the value for the DB connection. And then of course your host and port username password settings would need to change based upon your database server. So these are supported out of the box. So in our case, we want MySQL. My host is the local host. My port is 3306. I believe that is the default. And the database doesn't exist, but we will create that here in a moment. And as far as the username and password for my database engine, it's root and the password is empty, which of course is not secure at all, but this is a development box, so that's okay. All right, so we want to create this first app database. And we're going to do that inside of our management tool since I'm using PHP admin. That is, of course, what you are going to see on screen. And we are just going to create that new database. Now, we could call this whatever we wanted, and then we could change the value in the .env file. But since the default here is first underscore app, which is basically the name of this project, we'll just run with that. It makes sense. And that's typically what I do in the real world anyway. If I need to create a database for an application, it's usually named after the application. So we are just going to put in the name of the database that we want to create and create it. And voila, we are good to go. Now, of course, we don't have any tables, but that's OK, because we will use Artisan to create those tables in the next lesson. As I mentioned in the previous lesson, we typically don't use our database management tools for creating and working with our tables. Instead, we use Artisan to create and run what we call migrations. 
Now, migrations are really nothing more than a way of versioning a database. And it's really not a development tool as it is a production tool. It gives us the ability to not only make changes to our database safely, but we can also roll back those changes if we ever decide to. So really there's going to be two things that we need to do. We need to create a migration, which is for changing the structure of the database itself. So that's creating a table, it's adding columns, it's things like that. We also need to create what's called a model. This is the code that we use that actually interacts and works with the data inside of the database. So let's look at how we can do that. We will of course use Artisan and anytime we want to make something, we're going to prepend the command with make and in this case, migration. Let's look at the help. Now, at the very least, you have to provide a name, and most of the time, that's going to be it. But one thing to be aware of is that your names need to be specific, such as create guitars table. Or if you're going to add a column, then you would say add years column to guitars. I mean, it can get very long, but the reason is because it needs to be specific as to what it does, because as you'll see here in a few moments, there's a lot of migrations. So if you're vague in the names of your migrations, it's going to get confusing. So just be specific there. So that's how you would create a migration. Let's look at creating a model. So the command is make model. At the very least, you have to provide a name. The name of a model is the name of the class that is going to be used. So this is much easier than creating a migration. Now, in our case, we want to create a table, but we also need to create a model that's going to essentially interact with that table. So we need to do both of these things. They are related to one another. So it would be nice if we could create them at the same time. And we can by using the migration flag. So this is what we're going to do. We will use the make model command. We're going to call our model guitar. By convention, our model names are singular nouns. So if we needed a table to store uh, people's automobiles, you know, like cars, we would just call it car. Or if we were building some kind of real estate application to where we needed to store individual properties, we would call it property, you know, something along those lines. In our case, it's just going to be guitar. And then we want to specify the migration flag. And then whenever that runs, let's go to our project. Let's start by going to the database folder and then migrations. And you can see that there are already some migrations here. This is why I said that we need to be specific as to the name of our migrations, because if you just name them vague, like migration one, migration two, migration three, you don't really know what's going on here. So here we can see the create guitars table that was named automatically by Artisan because, well, that's what we're doing. We are creating a table. So let's open up this file and you're going to see that it's really nothing more than a class and it has two methods. The first is up, the second is down. The up method is for doing whatever this migration is for. So since this is for creating a guitars table, that's what is inside of the up method. Now remember I said that you can roll back a migration and that's what the down method is for, is to undo whatever was done inside of the up method. Now, a note of caution, you only want to undo whatever it is that you did inside of up. So in this case, this is creating guitars. The down method is going to drop guitars if it exists. It's not going to do anything else on any other table. It's just going to undo what up did. And if you try to do more than that, you can start running into issues. Now let's focus on the code that is creating this guitars table. You can see that it's using a builder type of syntax. We're not really defining columns here. We're just building a table using normal PHP code. So the first is ID. This is going to create a column that contains a unique identifier for every record. I am a firm believer in that every table that you create should have an ID. 
Even if you don't think you need one, you need one. So just always include the ID. Storage is cheap. And IDs, by default, are integer values, so they aren't going to take up a lot of space anyway. So just include it. You'll save yourself a lot of headache later. Then there's the timestamps, and this is a very nice little feature. This adds two columns. The first is going to contain the date and time that a record was created, and the second column is the date and time that the record was last modified. And that sounds like a lot of work, but we don't have to do it. It's done automatically. So that's nice to have. So let's build the rest of our guitars table because you, we've been working with this data already. So we're going to use this table object here and we want to add a column for the name of the guitar, which is going to be a string value. So we will pass in the name of the column that we want. So let's just call that name. Let's copy and paste that because we also need the brand of the guitar. But let's also include the year that the guitar was made. Now we could use a string, but that makes no sense whatsoever. So we're gonna make this an integer value because that's what a year is, it's an integer. And then as far as the name of the column is concerned, we could say year, but let's say year made. Now by convention, we use an underscore to separate names. Of course, you can follow whatever convention that you want, just be consistent in what you do. And of course, if you needed other columns, you can add those. There are a ton of methods for building a table. We're not going to go through them because we don't have that kind of time. So there will be a link in the description for this video that will take you to the documentation of all of the methods that will help you build a table. In our case, this is all that we need, so we're done here. So before we run this migration, let's look at our model that's inside of app and then the models folder, and then there's this guitar.php. This is nothing more than a class, and it's a very simple class. There are some things that we will add to this class, but for right now, this is going to be just fine. And one other thing that I want to point out is that this guitar extends model. And if we look at model, it's inside of a folder called eloquent. Eloquent is what's called an object relational mapping, or ORM. This is a very nice way of working with the data within a relational database. Because at the end of the day, what we get to work with is just normal PHP code. We don't have to write raw SQL. Although in some cases you might need to, but in most cases you don't. So Eloquent is the ORM that we use to interact with our data. And so this guitar is an Eloquent model. So before we close out this lesson, let's go back to the command line and we want to run the migration. So if we look at migrate, that is the command that we would use to run all of the migrations that haven't been run yet, which well, there's several. There's one, two, three, four, and then ours is the fifth. So it's going to run all of those migrations, but it's also going to keep track of the migrations that have and haven't been ran. But really, that's not what I wanted to show you. Uh, let's just run PHP Artisan because Migrate has some very useful things, such as Fresh, which is going to essentially drop all of the tables and it will rerun all of the migrations. So as you're developing and you find that you just need to start fresh, you can use migrate fresh and then that's going to start you over, at least as far as the database is concerned. But then there's the reset, which is going to roll back all of the database migrations, or you can roll back just the last database migration. In our case, we want to just run the migrate command because that is going to run our migrations. You're going to see that it ran all of those migrations. And if we look at our database management tool, we're going to see those tables. Of course, the one that we are concerned with is guitars right there. And if we look at this database table, there's of course not going to be any data, but we can at least see the file structure where we have the ID, the name, the brand, the year made, the created at, and the updated at columns. So in the next lesson, we're going to create a form that we will use to create and store data in our guitars table. 
we are finally ready to start working with actual data now that we have a guitars table and our guitar model. And the first thing that we need to do is create a view that's going to have the form so that we can submit data to the server and then we can take that information and store it in the database. So let's start by going to our controller, app HTTP controllers and then guitars controller. And we want to implement the create method because this is what is going to be called in order to show our form. So all we need to do is return that view and the view name is going to be guitars.create. So we can create that view or we can copy it from another view and let's copy it. Let's use the show because that's going to give us the least amount of stuff that we need to change. And we will, of course, call this create.blade.php. And I am going to paste in the markup for this form because you don't want to see me type all of this out. But it's very simple. There are three fields. The first is guitar-name. That's for the name of the guitar. Then we have another field for brand. And then one for the year. Now, the very important thing here is the name attributes, because that is what's going to be used to submit the data to the server. That's what the browser needs. And there's also some CSS that I'm going to add to our sites.css file that is inside of public CSS and then site.css. We're not going to go over this. It's just adding some rules so that our form isn't going to look completely horrible. So with that done, we should be able to go to guitar slash create and we will see our form. There it is. Now, of course, we could fill this out and submit it, but we're not going to be doing anything with that because we need to write that code. So let's do just that. The first thing that we need to do is add a use statement so that we can pull in the guitar class. So that is app slash model slash guitar. And then we want to create a new instance of this class. So that will be the first thing that we do. We can just call that guitar. And here's the idea. We are going to assign values to the appropriate properties. Well, our properties are the names of the columns that we created. So we have a name property, a brand property, and then this year underscore made. So it's going to look like this, where we say guitar name equals, and we're going to use this request that was passed as the parameter to this method. This is a lot like the request function that we used all those lessons ago whenever our routes were inside of the web.php file. And in fact, we could use request here if we wanted. But since we have this request object, let's just go ahead and let's use that. Now, instead of using this like the request function, this is an object and we want to retrieve the input that was provided. So we call a method called input and then we pass in the name of the form field that we want to retrieve here, which was guitar dash name. And then we just need to rinse and repeat for the other values. So we had brand, which just happened to be the same name as the form field. So we will reuse that. Then we had year underscore made. And in the request, that was just year. So we are building this object one property at a time. And then finally, we want to save that in the database. So we call the save method on this guitar object, and then we're good to go. But then we want to do something else. We don't want to just save the guitar and then stay there. We want to redirect to someplace else. And where we redirect to really depends upon our application. So we could call a function called redirect. And then we could pass in the URL of wherever it is that we want to redirect to. But, you know, URLs change. And it would be nice to have the flexibility of using the route name to generate that URL. And we can do just that. By calling redirect, this is going to return an object that has a route method. And then we just specify the route name of where we want. And I think going to the guitars index makes sense in this case. So that whenever we create the guitar, it'll take us back to the index so that we can then see all of the guitars that have been created. But of course, the guitars that we are displaying are all hard coded. So instead of calling this get data method that we have, we can use our guitar model and we can retrieve all of the records. 
that's essentially going to give us the same thing. But of course, now we're going to be reading data from the database. So in this case, we are creating and we are reading. That's the C and R of CRUD. So let's go to the browser. Oh, there's one other thing. Uh, let's go back to our create view because we need to specify the action here. I did not do that. And once again, we can use route in this case. And then we will simply have the route function generate the URL for the guitars.store route. So with that in place, let's go back to the browser. Let's refresh so that that is going to change. And let's store some data. So let's store a Starla S2. The brand is going to be PRS, year made. Uh, it really doesn't matter. Let's say 2015. And then let's submit. And what do we get? 419 page expired. What, what in the world does that mean? Well, we just performed a post request, which is supposed to change something on the server. And there are other types of requests that do that as well. There's update, delete, and a few others. But the main thing is that we are changing something, which is useful, but it's also very dangerous because requests can be forged. An attacker can forge a request to our application and if we're not careful, it will execute that request and it could end up completely destroying our application or at least the data that our application is working with. So this type of request is called a cross-site request forgery or a CSRF. It's very common. And the way that we prevent this type of attack is including a special form field in our form. It has a particular value that the server is expecting. And if that value isn't there, or if that value is different than what the server expects, then it's going to reject that request. As I said, this is a very common type of attack. Every language, platform, and framework has some easy way of dealing with it. So Laravel gives us a directive simply called CSRF. That's all that we have to do. We need to add this to our form it can be anywhere in the form, and that's going to solve our problem. So let's go back, let's refresh, and let's inspect so that we can see that form field. You can see that it is a hidden form field, and it has a particular value. If that value isn't there, or if it's different, no cigar. So with that in place, we can now fill out this form. So we'll redo Starla S2. The brand is PRS. I think we did 2015 for the year made. If we submit this, then we shouldn't see any kind of errors. But of course we do. Map model guitar or app model guitar not found. Well, let's make sure that I did that correctly. So let's open up models. And that's the problem. Models is plural. It's not singular. So we need to change that so that it's models. Let's go back. Let's refresh. Uh, we can resubmit this form. That's going to be fine. So we'll just click on continue. And here we are back at the index. We can see that we are reading data from the database because now we see Starla S2, but we didn't display anything about the year. So let's go ahead and let's add that to the index view so that we can put this inside of our list here so that it was made by the brand and it was made on a particular year. We'll just call that year made. And then we will have the year made listed. So we can go back, refresh, and there we have that. Well, that's all well and good. However, there is no validation going on. So in the next lesson, we are going to look at how we can validate the input. The first rule of user input is to never trust user input. The second rule of user input is to never trust user input. We should never trust user input. We should always sanitize the inputs, which we did not do in the previous lesson. We should have done that. So let's go ahead and let's strip those tags. But that's not enough. We also need to make sure that the data that the user provided is what we expect because the user can provide anything and it's up to us to be sure that it meets our expectations. Like for example, they could just submit a blank form. Now that's going to error out thankfully and it's not going to create a blank record, but they could fill out everything correctly, but they might have something that is not a year, in which case our application is going to fail. So yes, there is client-side validation, 
But that can be circumvented. It's just JavaScript. And there are some clients that might turn JavaScript off completely. So our application that's running on the server is the gatekeeper. It is what is accepting the data. It's what's storing the data. So we need to validate it before we do anything with it. So thankfully, Laravel makes it very easy to validate our data. With the request object, we have a method called validate. And then we pass in an array where the keys are the form field names. And then the values for these keys are nothing more than the types of validation that we want to perform. So for our guitar name, really the only validation that we can do is make sure that we actually have a value because a guitar name can be anything. And really the same is true for the brand as well. So we would have guitar name, then we would have brand, and both of those would be required. But then we have the year. Now the year is a little bit different because yes, we do need a year, but we also need to be sure that it is an integer value. So we have two validations that we need to perform here. And we can specify that by separating the validations with a pipe character. So in this case, we want to be sure that the year is in the request, but we also want to make sure that it is an integer. Now, an alternative way of specifying that is to use an array, which this is what I prefer to use. So that each element in the array is the type of validation that we want to perform. And there are tons of validation. I will have a link in the description for the video. You can also write custom validation, which we're not going to get into. But the key thing here is that for the majority of our purposes, the built-in validators are going to give us the functionality that we need. So by just validating our input, we can go back to our form, we can submit this, and we're going to see that there is no error. It just looked like that nothing happened. But in fact, something did happen. The server did receive the information. It did validate it. So we need to show the validation errors. So let's go to our view. And we do that with a blade directive simply called error. And we can use this like a function to where we pass in the name of the form field that we want to get the error for. But then we also need to use the end error. And so inside of this directive, we just have the markup that's going to display our error. So let's say that we are going to have a div with a class of, uh, we'll just call it form error. We don't have this class, but we will add it. And then we want to display the message for the error for this form field. And we have a special variable called message. It's built in and it is scoped to this particular error. So what we can do then is take this error directive and we can paste it everywhere else and then just change the name of the form field so that we have the error for the brand. We leave the message alone because once again, that is kind of scoped to this error directive. And then we will do the same thing for the year. Whenever we go back to the browser, we should be able to just refresh this and it will, well, no, it won't. Let's resubmit this and then we are going to see the error messages pop up. Now, of course, that doesn't look very good, so let's open up our CSS file, and let's add that class. And we'll make this some kind of child of form, and the class is form error. Let's set the font size to something smaller. So let's do 0.75 REM. Let's make the color red. Let's also make the font bold so that it kind of stands out. So with that, we should be able to resubmit this and we are going to see, there we go. The guitar name field is required. The brand field is required. The year field is required. So if we fill these out, uh, we already have a Starla, uh, let's say a Vela S2 and the brand would be PRS but let's put something that is not a numeric value for the year. If we submit this, we are going to see all of the errors for the guitar name and brand go away, but we see that the year must be an integer. But also notice that we've lost the values for the fields that were good. So what we can do then is use a special directive. Well, it's not really a directive. It's a function that will get us the old value for that field. So for each one of these fields, we're going to use the value attribute 
and we're going to call this old function and then pass in the name of the form field. So in this case, it'll be guitar name, and then let's just copy and paste this wherever we need to. For the brand, we'll change it to simply brand. And then of course the year will be the year. So now let's go back. Let's fill this back out so that we have the Vela S2, the brand is PRS, and then once again, we will have something other than an integer value. Whenever we submit this, those values will be retained. And um, yeah, we didn't change that old value to year, did we? So there we go. If we submit this, we're going to see the same thing. But now we can change this so that, uh, let's say 2016 for the year. And whenever we submit this, then everything is going to be validated. It is saved into the database. So handling user input is actually very easy. We simply use the validate method to validate the user input. We specify the validators that we want to use and Laravel does the rest. If it encounters any validation errors, then we can simply display those using the error directive. We specify the field name that we want to display the error for, and then the message. And of course, we also want to repopulate valid fields with the old value. So we use the old function to get that value. But of course, once validation passes, we are good to go. We can store that information in the database. So in the next lesson, we are going to look at how to edit our data. It's actually very similar to saving. Editing is very much like creating. We are working with the same data. We are almost doing the same exact processes. There's just a slight difference between the two. But other than that, they are the same. So there's going to be a lot of copying and pasting. So let's start by showing our form. Now, well, actually, we should start with the show method because this is still showing the data that is hard coded. So let's do that. Let's go to the individual page of the guitar. We can see that that is not right. So here's what we can do. We can fetch the data from the database using our guitar model. There's a find method that we could pass the ID to, and then it's going to find the record with that ID, and then we would have a record. Then we could check if it existed, and if not, then you know we get a 404, otherwise, we pass that record on to the view. That's fine. An alternative is this, find or fail. It's almost the exact same thing, except that it is going to automatically fail and return a 404 if it can't find that record. So in fact, we could inline this so that our show method is going to be very, very clean. So there's nothing like code that works except clean code that works. So there we go. We have that same exact functionality. If we go back to the browser, this is of course going to show data from the database, except that it's not because uh, that was a syntax error. But now we can go back and there it is. We do need to add the year there because since we are going to be editing this information, I want to be sure that we show all of the information that we have. So actually we could copy this from the index view and we could paste that inside of the show view and that will be fine for our edit action method we can essentially do the same thing except that we want to display a different view we want to display the edit view and we need to change the parameter name to guitar but other than that that's going to be fine now our edit view is going to be a copy of the create view because Remember, this is the same exact data. So the create form is already there, ready for us to use. We'll just copy it and use it as a basis for our edit form. Now we don't want to display the old information because that was what the user typed into the form field after they submitted it the first time and validation failed. Instead, what we want to show is the data coming from the database. So we are going to be working with the guitar that is passed to this view. And I'm going to use object property syntax here. We could use the associative array syntax if we wanted to. That's what we did inside of the index and show views. However, just to show you that we could use this other syntax, I'm going to use object property syntax. 
Of course, in your applications, pick one and stick with it. Consistency is very important. All right, so we will have the name, we'll have the brand, and then finally, the year made. And for the most part, that's it. We do need to change how this form is submitted because it is currently being submitted to the guitars store route. We want the update route, but we also need to supply the guitar that is going to be updated. So we need to include that, that is coming from the guitar object and we can provide the ID there. And that is the completely wrong syntax. We want arrow there but that's going to give us the correct URL. The other thing that we need to change is the method. We want to use a put because put requests are for updating data. However, browsers don't understand put when it comes to a form submission. It only understands get and post. So we have to emulate a put request by using a blade function called method. We pass in the HTTP method that we want to emulate, and then we're good to go. So even though this is an actual post request, our application is going to accept the request. It's going to see that we want to emulate a put request, and it's going to route it to the update route. So everything is going to be just fine. So if we go to slash guitars, slash ID, slash edit, we should see our form, and we do. If we go to the guitars slash two slash edit, we should see that other guitar. If we go to slash three, which does not exist, we should get a 404. And there we go. So we are good to go there. So now we just need to write the code that's going to handle the submission. And for the most part, we can almost copy the exact same code from the store method and use that because we still want to validate the user input we are still going to need to assign values for name, brand, year made. The only difference is we need to fetch the guitar from the database as opposed to creating a new guitar. So we are going to copy this entire thing and we're going to paste it inside of our update method. And instead of creating a guitar, we are going to fetch it from the database. But once again, we are going to use this find or fail because if the record doesn't exist, we don't want to do anything. We want a 404 there. So we do need to change the name of this variable because guitar is the parameter with the ID. So we are going to use record here and we're going to save it. As far as the redirection, I think it makes more sense to redirect to the show route but we also need to supply the id and we can do that with just the guitar there so now let's just test this and make sure that it's actually going to work so we could edit the name let's also edit the year but remember that the year has to be an integer value so let's do something that's very different 2000 so if we submit this we should be taken back to the page for that guitar. We can see that the name is different. We can see that the year is different. So we successfully updated that data. Now, as I mentioned at the beginning of this lesson, there's a lot of repetition because these processes are almost identical. So in the next lesson, we are going to start to see how we can eliminate some of that duplication. We have some duplicate code inside of our controller, and I wouldn't say that our controller is messy, but this duplicate code does add, well, quite a few extra lines of code, and it would be nice if we could clean this up just a little bit, because I am a firm believer in having clean and concise controllers, because that just makes maintenance so much easier. So the first thing that we are going to look at is essentially this right here, where we are trying to find a guitar from the database. If we find it, then great. If not, then it returns a 404. We do this in three places, and really we would do it in four if we implement the destroy method, because we would want to make sure that the given ID exists in the database before we actually try to delete it. And the way that we can clean this up is just by using our model guitar as a type hint for the parameter. Because Laravel then is going to take the ID that is given to us from the URL and it is going to automatically try to find 
that guitar in the database. If it exists, then great, we have it. If not, it will automatically fail and return a 404. So we can eliminate that code very easily. So let's just do that. We will use a type hint for the show the edit and then the update method. Except that update is going to be a little bit more involved because we need to change the name of the variable that we use. We are no longer going to be using the record variable because we will have this guitar. And then the ID will need to be used for the redirect. And there we go. Now, we didn't really save a whole lot there, but at least it's a little bit cleaner. Besides, the bulk of this controller is really the store and the update methods. We are essentially doing the same thing, where we are validating the user input, and then we are updating the values of the properties of the record that we are either creating or updating. And in the process of that, we are stripping the HTML tags. So it would be nice if we could do all of that in kind of one place, so that we aren't repeating ourselves well, we're gonna to have to repeat ourselves somewhat, but we could eliminate that repetition because we have this request type here and we can actually build our own custom request that would then be used for handling our guitar form requests. So let's go to the command line. We are going to use Artisan to make a request and we're going to call it guitar form request. This is going to generate a new class for us that is going to allow us to not only validate the information, but also work with the request data before we validate it. Because it does kind of make sense to go ahead and strip out all of the tags before we validate. Uh, you can make arguments for either approach. It really doesn't matter. What does matter is that we can do this all inside of this class. This is inside of app HTTP requests that was not there to begin with, but it is now. And then there is our guitar form request. Now, by default, there are two methods. There's authorize and rules. Now, this is returning false for authorize. And this is going to mean that we are not going to be authorized to make this type of request. So the first thing we want to do is return true here. Now, of course, if there was a need to make sure that the user was authorized, then the code necessary would be inside of here, but we're not going to worry about that. We're just going to return true because, well, we want to authorize ourselves to make this request. And then we have this other method called rules. These are the exact same rules that we do inside of our validation code in the controller. So we can just copy and paste there. And that's going to give us the exact same thing. However, I also want to go ahead and strip out all of the tags so that we don't have to do that any other place. And we can do that by implementing another method here. It's going to be a protected method called prepare for validation. And what we want to do is take the information that we are working with and merging it into uh, this object, basically, that we are working with. So we have a method called merge. So if we needed to include another form field that didn't come from the user, like for example, if we had the code for user authentication and we needed to supply the user ID, then we could do that very easily by just merging that in here. But in our case, what we're going to do is essentially overwrite the values that we have as far as the guitar name and the brand and the year so that it would look like this, to where we are going to strip the tags here. And then we are going to work with the data that's coming from the request. So in this case, it's going to be this guitar name. Then we will do the same thing for the brand, so that we will strip the tags out of that input field. In this case, I'm going to use just the uh, object property syntax. The only reason why I didn't for the guitar name is because, well, guitar name is not a valid PHP identifier, but brand is as well as year. So we will essentially do the same thing that we did for brand. So we are taking the existing data from the request and merging that in so that we are essentially overriding those values by stripping out any HTML tags, and that's automatically going to be done for us. 
so that then all we have to do is use this guitar form request inside of our controller. Let's first of all import that. We need to use app that's HTTP requests and then the guitar form request. Then for the store method, you know, we, it's already being type hinted as request. We're going to use a guitar form request. And then we are going to do this. We will have our data, but we only want the validated data. So we're going to take the request and we're going to get the validated data. Now, there's a difference between validated and validate. Validate is the method that we just replaced. We want the validated values so that then we can use them whenever we assign the name, brand, and year made. So with a few modifications, that's all that we are going to do. And then we just need to do the same thing for the update method. So let's just once again, copy and paste. As I mentioned, we can't completely get rid of the code duplication, but we can make it easier to work with. So there we go. With that done, we can go back to the browser. Let's go to the edit field. And I guess I better make sure that I did save that. I did, okay. So here is the edit for the first guitar. Let's first of all, clear out the guitar name and let's submit it. We should see the error that says that this is required. Although no, it wouldn't. Validated does not exist. Why does it not exist? And that's because I did not use the guitar form request. So that's kind of an important piece there. So let's refresh. We will continue so that we resubmit the same information and we can see that the guitar name field is not required. Now it automatically filled back in the data from the database. That's fine. So we're going to change this back so that it doesn't have the edit value. We can also change the year made. I believe we had 2015 originally. We can submit and that is going to work just fine. But let's also try creating. So if we create a new guitar, then this can be what? We can have an Explorer, which is made by Gibson, and the year can be 1977. So we will submit that. We should then have three guitars in the database. We do. And while we still have some duplication, our code is indeed cleaner and easier to understand. We can also use mass assignment to clean up and simplify our code. There are, however, some issues that we will need to discuss. But first, what is mass assignment? Well, whenever we have created or updated a record in the database, we have done so by assigning the columns individually. We are being very explicit as to what we are setting, and then we are saving that record. That is individual assignment. Mass assignment is doing all of those things all at once. So the code to do so would look like this. In order to create a record, we would use our model class. It has a method called create, and then we would just pass in the data that we needed to create that record. And that's it. We no longer have to set name, brand, year made, or save, or anything like that. This one line of code will do all of that for us. And the same is true for update. So if we look at the update method, we still need to use our record object that we have in this guitar variable, but we would call an update method. We would once again pass in the data that we wanted to update and that's it. Everything else is done for us. That is mass assignment. So the first thing about mass assignment is that the data that we are passing to either the update method or the create method needs to have keys that are the same names as the columns in the database. Like for example, we have name in the database, but our form has guitar dash name. The database has year underscore made and the form has just year. So in order to use mass assignment, we need to change the field names in our forms so that they match the column names. That's not that big of a deal. So we can go ahead and do that. Now, as you're doing this, don't forget to change the values of the four attributes for the appropriate labels. That was for the year made. Well, it's now year made and for the name. 
Let's do the same thing inside of the edit view. And we also need to change the guitar form request class because we used these form field names there. And we did so really in two places. If we look at the rules, we need to modify those field names so that we have name and then year made. But when it comes to prepare for validation, we need to do the same thing. Now, since we just have a name property now, we can use the property syntax, and then we will change year made. We also need to change the keys here to match, but that's going to make everything work. So with these changes in place, we should be able to create and update these records. So let's go ahead and let's try that. Let's go to the create form and let's add a strat because we don't have one yet. The brand is Fender and the year made, uh, let's just do 2021. And whenever we submit this, we are going to get an error. And it says add name to fillable property to allow mass assignment. So here's the thing about mass assignment. It's very dangerous. You are taking the request data and even though we are validating it, which is very good, but we are just kind of blindly passing that on to the update and the create methods saying here database, take this information and create or update a record. And that's really not a big deal for the data that we are working with, but imagine that you are building a system that is working with some sensitive information like user accounts. And while you are validating that information, you aren't really checking everything. Maybe the user supplied some extra fields in the request that would then be populated in the database if there was a matching column name. There's a lot of things that can go wrong with mass assignment. So it is something that we have to opt into. And if we look at this message again, it says add name to fillable property. So what this means is we go to our guitar model and we are going to add a property. It's a protected property called fillable. And this is simply an array that contains the columns that are okay to mass assign. In our case, that's just about every one of them. So that means name, brand, and year made. But if we left any one of these off, then Eloquent will not allow that column to be assigned a value using mass assignment. We would have to do so explicitly like we did before by assigning a value to that column. But as I said, the data that we are working with is okay to mass assign. There's nothing sensitive, nothing that's going to break or cause some kind of vulnerability within our application. So now we can go back, let's refresh, and we'll just hit continue here so that it will resubmit that form, and then everything should work. We should see our list of guitars, and here we can see the strat that we added. And of course, if we wanted to test the editing of that, all we have to do is go to the edit form for that guitar. Let's add edited to the name, and then we will submit. And once again, we are going to see that that works. Because now that we set that fillable property in our guitar model, this works for creating and updating. It's a one-time set thing. So there's nothing wrong with using mass assignment. Just be very careful when you do so. If there are columns in your database that control how the application behaves or controls a user's access to certain parts of your application, don't make those columns fillable. It adds a little extra work on your part, but it makes your code much safer. Laravel is a fantastic framework, and it's no wonder that it has become the go-to application framework for PHP. It's my hope that by now you have a solid foundation in the fundamentals of building Laravel applications. But of course, we've just scratched the surface. Now that you have gotten started with Laravel, you can dive deeper into the framework, and you'll learn something new every time you start developing a new project. I highly recommend that you spend some time reading the documentation. It is very well written and highly informative, but it can also give you some insight if you find yourself hitting a brick wall. Laravel also has a fantastic community ready to help for whenever you need it. Just remember that no matter what type of issue you face, someone, and perhaps everyone, has faced it too. And we are more than happy to help. 
Thank you so much for watching this course. Please feel free to contact me through Twitter or the Tuts Plus forums if you have any questions. From all of us here at Tuts Plus, thank you, and I will see you next time.